Chapter seven of The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. Now there were three of us sitting in the waiting room, waiting to hear how Daly and Johnny were. Then the reporters and the police came. They asked too many questions too fast and got me mixed up. If you wanna know the truth, I wasn't feeling real good in the first place. Kind of sick, really. And I'm scared of policemen anyway. The reporters fired one question right after another at me and got me so confused, I didn't know what was coming off. Derry finally told them I wasn't in any shape to be yelled at so much, and they slowed down a little. Derry's kind of big. Soda Pop kept them in stitches. He'd grab one guy's press hat and another's camera and walk around interviewing the nurses and mimicking TV reporters. He tried to lift a policeman's gun and grinned so crazily when he was caught that the policeman had to grin too. Soda can make anyone grin. I managed to get hold of some hair grease and comb my hair back so that it looked a little better before they got any pictures. I'd die if I got my picture in the paper with my hair looking so lousy. Derry and Soda Pop were in the pictures too. Jerry Wood told me that if Soda Pop and Derry hadn't been so good looking, they wouldn't have taken so many. That was public appeal, he said. Soda was really getting a kick out of all of this. I guess he would have enjoyed it more if it hadn't been so serious, but he couldn't resist anything that caused that much excitement. I swear, sometimes he reminds me of a cult, a long-legged Palomino cult that has to get his nose into everything. The reporter stared at him admiringly. I told you, he looks like a movie star, and he kind of radiates. Finally, even Soda Pop got tired of the reporter. He gets bored with the same old thing after a time. And stretching out on a long bench, he put his head in Derry's lap and went to sleep. I guess both of them were tired. It was late at night, and I knew they hadn't had much sleep during the week. For even while I was answering questions, I remembered that it had been only a few hours since I was sleeping off a smoke in the corner of the church. Already, it was an unreal dream. And yet, at the time, I couldn't have imagined any other world. Finally, the reporters started to leave along with the police. One of them turned and asked, what would you do right now if you could do anything you wanted? I looked at him tiredly, take a bath. They thought that was pretty funny. I meant it. I felt lousy. The hospital got real quiet after they left. The only noise was the nurse's soft footsteps and so does light breathing. Derry looked down at him and grinned half-heartedly. He didn't get much sleep this week, he said softly. He hardly slept at all. Hmm, Soda said drowsily. You didn't either. The nurses wouldn't tell us anything about Johnny and Daly, so Derry got hold of the doctor. The doctor told us that they would only talk to the family, but Derry finally got it through the guy's head that we were about as much family as Daly and Johnny had. Daly would be okay after two or three days in the hospital, he said. One arm was badly burned and would be scarred for the rest of his life, but he would have full use of it in a couple of weeks. Daly will be okay, I thought. Dallas is always okay. He could take anything. It was Johnny I was worried about. He was in critical condition. His back had been broken when that piece of timber fell on him. He was in severe shock and suffering from third degree burns. They were doing everything they could to ease the pain. Although since his back was broken, he couldn't even feel the burns below his waist. He kept calling for Dallas and Pony Boy. If he lived, if, please no, I thought, please not if, the blood was draining from my face and Derry put an arm across my shoulder and squeezed hard. Even if he lived, he'd be crippled for the rest of his life. You wanted it straight and you got it straight, the doctor said. Now go home and get some rest. I was trembling. A pain was growing in my throat and I wanted to cry. But greasers don't cry in front of strangers. Some of us never cry at all, like Daly and Tubit and Tim Shepard. They forgot how at an early age. Johnny crippled for life. I'm dreaming. I thought in panic. I'm dreaming. I'll wake up at home or in the church and everything will be like it used to be. But I didn't believe myself. Even if Johnny did live, he'd be crippled and never play football or help us out in a rumble again. He'd have to stay in that house he hated, where he wasn't wanted, and things could never be like they used to be. I didn't trust myself to speak. If I said one word, the hard knot in my throat would swell and I'd be crying in spite of myself. 
I took a deep breath and kept my mouth shut. Soto was awake by then, and although he looked stony-faced, as if he hadn't heard a word the doctor had said, his eyes were bleak and stunned. Serious reality has a hard time coming through to Soda, but when it does, it hits him hard. He looked like I felt when I had seen that black-haired Soch lying doubled up and still in the moonlight. Derry was rubbing the back of my head softly. We better go home. Can't do anything here. In our Ford, I was suddenly overcome by sleepiness. I leaned back and closed my eyes, and we were home before I knew it. Soda was shaking me gently. Hey, pony boy, wake up. You were still got to get to the house. Hmm, I said sleepily and lay down in the seat. I couldn't have gotten up to save my life. I could hear Soda and Derry, but as if from a great distance. Come on, pony boy, Soda pleaded, shaking me a little harder. We're sleepy too. I guess Derry was tired of fooling around because he picked me up and carried me in. It's getting mighty big to be carried, Soda said. I wanted to tell him to shut up and let me sleep, but I only yawned. He sure lost a lot of weight, Derry said. I thought that I should at least pull off my shoes, but I didn't. I went to sleep the minute Derry tossed me on the bed. I'd forgotten how soft a bed really was.